All okay? So we leave it open till 19. So what we do, we also, as and when the people enter the waiting room, no, we screen out to some extent, then admit them. That is one more precaution we have taken so that yes, our invite is only join in actually. <clears throat> Minute to go. We'll go on air. Uh, Shankar, all okay? Uh, yes, all set, sir. Please, sir. Lovely. Uh, very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very warm welcome to another edition of our evening uh, program. Uh, we have been keeping you busy since the time the lockdown was declared on 25th of March. Uh, I'm happy to share with you every day. Uh, our events have been becoming popular day by day. In case we miss to send the message uh, by a few minutes, uh, I get so many calls, what happened, why the message? We start the day every day with uh, yoga by uh, specialist. Uh, we have been partnering with Isha Yoga. Every morning, 8 to 9, uh, we are bringing you live quiz. Uh, really, I'm surprised. I never thought it was going to be so popular. We are across the thousand mark, actually. And uh, it's become an addiction for many. They say they don't uh, do this quiz program. They're becoming so stressful in the morning. So we are now really planned out. And without any interpretation, we have been bringing you the quiz every morning to continue your thought process. Thereafter, uh, every morning, 11 o'clock, uh, the thought leader of outstanding achievers are going to talk to you on different subjects. And then after one o'clock, we are sharing you excellent articles uh, done by, again, thought leaders. Uh, from two to five o'clock every day, we are doing a number of workshops, certificate course training programs. And another uh, event in the evening, six o'clock, is one such event, what you are bringing to every day. Like the one today, we are, what we are bringing to you, which is relevant to today, excess your way to stress-free life by uh, Dr. Enapadam Krishnamurthy and Sheila Nambiar. I'll be introducing to you later. Before that, uh, uh, we have lined up some outstanding programs uh, the week coming to end, and we want to end it with the 17th, uh, the COVID lockdown. Uh, till then, we are bringing you some lo lovely events, and uh, so that you get back to work, you'll be fresh with so many thoughts in your mind about so many issues, what's happening today. And let me briefly tell you, by any chance, you have missed your inbox, what's the event happening next few days. Then on the 11th of May, that is uh, day after tomorrow, we are having an event on customer experience in a COVID world by Debashish Sarkar, he's a global uh, thought leader. And he's going to speak on the changing ecosystem and tactics that will make us very successful and best practice around the world. This will be not to be missed even. He's an authority on customer expectations. So do please do join, log in on the 11th of May. And on 13th of May, uh, at 9 a.m. in the morning, we have an uh, international speaker on time management. We all have so much time at our disposal. We don't know what to time. All the time, we used to only talk about there's no time to, to do so many activities. But how many of you have done a self-introspection, used this lockdown date very, very usefully? I don't know. But this gentleman is going to talk to you on time management. He's an international speaker from Chicago. That's why he brought at 9 o'clock because of the time difference. By the time we finish the talk, it'll be midnight. But if you talk to us, please not. It is happening at 9 o'clock in the morning on 6. Then we also bring out, as I mentioned, a leaders speak series, bringing some outstanding political leaders to come and talk to us. Leaders will share their insight on how India can put uh, the you know, push the boundaries and drive the post-COVID uh, world order. And the, each of the leader whom we invite is going to talk, share the insight. The first leader who is going to speak on the 30th evening at 6 p.m. is Dr. Virappa Mauli. He is a former uh, Chief Minister of Karnataka and also former Union Minister. He's going to talk to us on political and administrative reform, which are relevant today, uh, what's happening post-COVID. And uh, he is the one who has put in place ad administrative reform committee when he was a Union Minister, even that is called even till today. 
Then thereafter, on the 14th, we have again interesting event on uh, both role in commitment in the company's sustainability and success in the current time. Because the board of directors play a very important role today in businesses. How their role is going to be different today when the expectations of the shareholders, stakeholders are totally different. We got four outstanding speakers who are going to be shared. And Mr. Bajpai is a former CB chairman and also former LAC chairman. Uh, Intuit Consulting is also founder. And uh, uh, Mr. Aribhakti, CA, Chartered Accountant, uh, one of the most, most popular brand known in the field of Chartered Accountancy. And Jangu Dalal, again, managing, managing director of uh, Intuit Consulting. And uh, Ravi uh, Purushottaman, who is the president of Danforth. Therefore, I'm going to discuss and put the correct perspective of what's all about board. Then on 15th, we have again an outstanding political leader is going to speak to us. Uh, Bathur Hari Mehtab is going to be is a member of parliament. He's a chairman of Standing Committee for Labor. He is uh, going to speak to us on COVID-19 impact on Indian economy. You must listen to this gentleman, Biju Patnaik. He's been six-term member of parliament. He's got the award last year as an outstanding parliamentarian because you must speak to the, some of the people who are uh, who are really done phenomenal work in parliament. You listen to him, I think at least I'll walk miles to listen to this gentleman. Then on the 16th, we are trying to fix our brand summit, uh, which we are in call, uh, contact with some of the outstanding speakers. If it happened, it will happen on 16th May at 11 o'clock. Then 21st of May, I don't know how many of you know, it's a World Cultural Diversity Day. And since we have come to know, we thought we must celebrate a diversity day and we are having a unity in diversity. Uh, Dr. Savantia Rajesh will be founder president of Abta Group, along with Bhavani Balasan Prabhupada, diversity inclusive leader of Deloitte will be uh, talking to. These are some of the view events, otherwise all other events will be going through. I haven't uh, changed anything until the, the, the COVID get over, 19, uh, the lockdown, we'll be bringing you some outstanding events. Coming to today's event, uh, you all know, uh, secret of... Uh... Now, what is that event way? Exercise your way to stress-free life. We all want to bring it to you, secret of supercharge your health. You know, this is even we want to really supercharge yourself, listen to something. Even the takeaway is 10% as will be outstanding. And we want to, you know, we, we got two outstanding speakers, Dr. Enapadam Krishnamurti and Dr. Sheila will be talking to you. I'll introduce you a short while ago, uh, you know, short while ago from now. And the team today is going to focus on number of issues. What kind of stress related to a problem you will see and will be relieved? What is the scientific proof that exercise helps you to improve your mental health? What are the recommendations for your professional middle age and you know, above 60 people? What about women? What do they do in terms of practices? Exercise and physiology, is it improve your mental health? Jogging and lifespan. Food, I remember food. My grandmother, mother has put so much of rice and so much of the purple, uh, actually, and put so much of ghee. And they said, this is what you should be eaten. But when I went to my Air Force Academy, the whole lifestyle of food got changed over a period. But is it still stands good? Uh, people have got different opinion, actually. So what food you should eat? We've got two outstanding experts going to be speaking to you. Let me have the privilege of welcoming our both the panelists for this evening. Let me have the privilege of introducing Dr. Ennapadam Krishnamurti. <coughs> He is the current president of the International Neuropsychiatric Association and he is also international academic leader in epilepsy and dementia. He is also adjunct professor in Manipal University. He advises T.S. Srinivasan chair in Nemans, uh, editor of a global approach series of books uh, from the Cambridge University of international uh, uh, publishers and 70 plus peer review publications, social impact leader in healthcare, founder of Buddhi Clinic, uh, chain offering integrated and holistic brain and mind care, and he's not new to MMA. He has spoken a number of occasions. At the end of the thing, I'm going to request him for something. What you could do it for members of MMA. Please hold on. We'll be sharing with you as soon as the program is uh, coming to an end. Then we have another distinguished uh, panelist for this evening is Dr. Sheila Nambia. She is a famous gynecologist, lifestyle medicine uh, physician, and fitness consultant. Author of three best-selling author. First book being uh, Get uh, Size Wise. The second book, Gain to Lose. And the third book is Fitness after 40, I think. These are best-selling uh, books, which uh, I think one must read if you are really very curious about your healthcare. And graduated from Madras Medical College and postgraduate from the Manipal University, Manipal Medical College. Certified lifestyle medicine uh, physician and also from the from uh, the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Her article appears regularly in National Dailies and also in Hindu. She writes regularly in Hindu, which most of the people read. And also a regular TEDx speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a... Uh, Fantastic time in the evening with knowledge of lifelong learning for you in terms of health and fitness. And as usual, if you have the question, please put it in your chat box. All the viewers who are watching the program live from uh, YouTube, Facebook, and our webinar, 
as usual send your questions through uh, your whatsapp sms message my team will compile and put up across to me and uh, we are already uh, going to be full uh, already reached 80 plus uh, participants uh, i think uh, krishna murthy and uh, uh, shila madam very warm welcome to you and all to you we are all eagerly looking forward to hearing you and keep us fit and energetic all through post covid sir over to you sir uh, thank you so much uh, uh, captain vijay kumar for uh, inviting both of us to do this and i'd like to may, uh, say a special thanks to dr shila nambiar for readily agreeing to do this amidst a very busy schedule as an obstetrician and gynecologist um today we are going to talk about uh, stress free life there was one comment right at the beginning for the organizers that the volume is a bit low uh, i request a bit of adjustment on that uh, by the the team looking after that um the uh, you know we're going to talk about stress and how to manage stress uh, through exercise and how exercise can help improve your mental health uh, and and i think uh, you know i'm sure that uh, we'll find uh, many of the concepts that come across today to us from uh, dr sheela uh, very interesting um, i thought i'd set the stage by just outlining a little bit about what stress is and in general how you manage stress and how you recognize it and then i'm going to let dr sheela make a short presentation of some of the concepts that she's thinking about after which we'll engage in a in a in a question uh, answer session and we will welcome questions from all of you uh, just a, a note to everyone that while this is going on your audio will be muted but you can use the chat to ask a question so please feel free to type in a question um uh, because that's the the way the webinar is is run um so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen to begin with um so let's try and see whether we can understand our own emotional health uh, a little better and what stress is stress is a range of circumstances just ordinary workplace or familial dissonance problems that we are facing on a day to day basis or sometimes it can go as far as serious mental disturbance and at the genesis of stress is a yawning gap between expectation and reality give you an example in a covid time our expectation is that life needs to go back to normal the reality is the government is very reluctant to Uh, open the doors and let us go back to normal rapidly and that causes us stress our inability to do what we want to do what achieve what we want to achieve is the genesis of stress for us uh, if you ask yourself what is stress events and situations that make you feel tension pressure anxiety anger how you feel in your mind that is stress and how your body reacts to it your heart rate goes up your muscles become tense your bowel or bladder becomes overactive you experience a sense of nervous energy that is also stress and while stress affects all of us there are people who are more sensitive people who worry more people who take what happens in their external environment to their heart and they tend to be more prone why do we stress out covid is a very good example of a catastrophe a calamity a disaster something that affects the whole world or affects nations or affects whole regions that causes stress major life events illness in oneself or a family member disability death divorce job changes these cause us stress everyday hassles commuting a noisy neighborhood these cause us stress but most importantly in the normal working life work and life balance issues not having enough time to relax one's mind not having enough personal time being too preoccupied with work these things cause stress too so is stress normal it is normal to have some stress and there is a normal physiological and a psychological response to stress and that's a common experience this is what prepares our mind and body to danger so if i felt no stress about today's seminar then i would not even look at my slides in advance of the seminar so in a sense uh, because you experience stress you prepare better stress also motivates you to perform better to achieve our goals to set new ones it fuels creativity so it's normal for most of us to experience some stress when confronted with difficult situations or life events but it's important to remember 
that too much stress is bad for us. So when does stress become uh, significant, needing medical attention? When you start feeling persistent anxiety, when your mood starts to change, goes from being sad to angry to irritable to euphoric, when you start feeling restless, either physically or mentally, when you experience an emotional unrest, and very often people who have physical symptoms that go on and on without an obvious cause. For example, we have patients who complain of chest pain or palpitations, worry that they are having a heart attack, they do the right thing. They go to a hospital, they get checked, but they find nothing wrong with them. They then put them through tests like ECG and echo. There's still nothing wrong with them. And then finally, they are told, oh, it may be stress. You better go see a psychologist or a psychiatrist. And that's when it all comes out that the physical symptom is because of emotional stress. So unexplained physical symptoms can be because of stress. And what's the mechanism? Here's a diagram of a man walking in, in the woods and there's a snake that he sees. What happens when he sees the snake? His eyes see the snake. The information goes through a part of the brain called the thalamus to the part of his brain called the visual cortex, which is able to identify that this is a snake. And then that information goes to the memory and emotional centers of the brain, which recognize, oh, this is a snake and a snake is dangerous. It may bite me. And then the heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, and blood flows into your muscles. What then happens is you're prepared either to fight the snake, beat him up with the stick, or flee the place, run away. And that whole thing happens in a matter of a few seconds. But your brain is therefore a very important part of the genesis of stress, because your brain is what perceives your environment. It's your brain that perceives danger. And please remember a brain that perceives danger can sometimes misperceive danger, can see problems where there are none. And that also is the common reason why we have stress. So why do we get physical symptoms when we get stressed out? One is of course the hormonal explanation I gave you, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But the other is because when we experience emotional conflicts, sometimes we are not able to deal with them at a conscious level we repress them, we put them in our subconscious. But your brain is like a dirty clothes box. It can only take so many dirty clothes. After some time, the dirty clothes start to spill out. And when they spill out, rather than emotional stress, you have a physical symptom. And that's why stress causes physical symptom. The diagram that you see shows you how the brain is connected through the spinal cord and the nervous system to every organ in your body. And this is why stress leads to hypertension. Stress leads to gaining weight, obesity. Stress leads to your lipid levels going up, high cholesterol, coronary heart disease, and atherosclerosis. Stress leads to diabetes. And even conditions like ulcers, we say the risk factors are hurry, worry, and curry. And of course, the curry is something that we in India don't like to avoid, but hurry and worry is something that we can certainly do something about. Stress also leads to a number of physical symptoms. So, and people sometimes don't understand that they are feeling stressed in their mind, but in actual fact, end up having a lot of bodily symptoms. Palpitations, tight chest, dry mouth, heart rate going up, breathing heavily, tingling in the hands and feet, the being lightheaded, feeling like you have to go to the bathroom, tremors in your hands. All these things can be the outcome of stress. Stress also has both direct and indirect effects on your immunity. Directly, it causes hormonal changes in you. Glucocorticoids are secreted. They are a kind of hormone. And these suppress your immunity. Indirect effects that when you are feeling stress, you sleep less well, you exercise less well. We're going to talk about exercise in a short while. And you eat inappropriately. You tend to smoke, you tend to drink. And all of that lowers your immunity too. Stress also comes when you have inner urges which are not in consonance with what is socially permissible. Let me give you an example. You have an urge to go for a walk during the lockdown and you want to walk without a mask. Socially, you realize that you're neither allowed to walk nor should you really be going out without a mask. And what then happens? The, the feelings are so anxiety provoking 
at the conscious level that you tend to repress them and they get converted into a physical symptom. And hence, stress results in physical symptoms. One of the important genesis concepts of stress is what we call learned helplessness. What we saw in the post-war assembly line workers where they had no control over the pace of their work and they would do the same thing like turn a screw several times. The line would stop, they could stop and take a break. When the line started, they had to go back. What's the modern equivalent? The modern equivalent is the IT guy who operates on international time in response to international demands with little control over the workplace. Another inter interesting concept that comes from this is what we call locus of control. When you feel in control of your circumstances, then you're, you manage your stress much better. But when you feel your circumstances are controlled by external factors, then you don't manage your stress very well and you become very vulnerable to it. Another important concept is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the bottom, we all need roti, kapda, and makan. We need food, clothing, and shelter. Then we have safety and security needs. We want the money in our bank uh, on the date of our salary. Then we have needs for love and belonging. We want to be cared for. Then we have esteem needs. We want people to respect us. And when we have all of this, we become self-actualized. But when this gets disturbed, any of these get disturbed, our ability to self-actualize, our ability to feel that everything is going very well goes down. And that becomes the genesis of stress. So how do you cope? And there's a very simple explanation. If you can't modify your situation, modify your expectations. Very often the situation during COVID, you may not like going to your job, but you have to go to work because that's important for your job. It's important for your survival. So what do you do? You learn to modify your expectations. You learn to cope with the negative emotions that you're having, or you learn to avoid or change that threatening situation that's causing you problems. Developing social support systems is important. Leading a healthy and predictable life. This is what doctors tell everyone else and fail to do. But this is important for all of us in good diet, exercise, rest and sleep, scheduling and planning, delegation of duties, moderation in all that you do. <clears throat> things can help you. Exercise, yoga, counseling, massage, religious and spiritual pursuits, meditation, relaxation training. Learning some of these techniques can be extremely helpful to any one of us who's experiencing the symptoms of stress. So please do consider learning some of these things. And please remember that very often mental health symptoms are an invisible disability. Nobody understands why the sufferer is finding it so difficult to go on with life as normal because they don't see, unlike a fractured hand, unlike a broken hip, they are not able to see what you're going through. What you're going through is deeply inside you and that becomes the problem. So please remember when someone you know is stressed out, it's very important to remember that they are suffering from an invisible disability. So as I said, some stress is necessary in order to make us uh, productive citizens. But at the same time, you need to manage your stress, recognize your psychological conflict, develop your own co coping strategies. Again, if you can't modify your situation, modify your expectations, regain your internal locus of control, learn how to be in charge of your circumstances, work towards self-actualization. Remember that money and power and material gain don't always give you self-actualization and nurture and so, uh, cherish your support systems family, friends, hobbies, and activities, they give your life real meaning. At Buddhi Clinic, we take this very holistic approach because we realize that stress, stress leads to pain and it can lead to this invisible disability. Stress leads to a number of lifestyle conditions. Uh, stress leads to memory complaints. So people need help when they are stressed out and we combine modern wisdom, um, um, modern science with ancient wisdom, trying to give people the best of all healthcare traditions. And we'd be very happy to uh, you know, welcome you to experience what we're doing. Uh, finally, and this is something I, my father used to repeatedly say, managing stress is about the right attitude. Life is a pudding full of plums, take it as it comes. 
And I think it's very, very important that we learn to take our circumstances and what's going on in our stride. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and I will invite uh, Dr. Sheila Nambiar to uh, make her presentation on how you can exercise your way to good mental health. Hi, Sheila, madam. You can start now. Uh, you can take the screen share and go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Krish. That was a wonderful introduction to stress. So I'm just going to talk about one of the ways in which we can we can um, manage our stress. This is only one of the ways, um, but it is a highly effective way of managing stress. In fact, exercise can be is probably one of the most transformative things that you can do for your brain. And as uh, Dr. Krishnamurti just said, uh, stress arises in the brain. So if we can do something to alter the way in which our brain functions, the way in which we perceive a situation, the way in which we approach a problem, uh, or even see this, the, the stress as it exists, then we can modify the stress because the external factors don't change. COVID exists. And uh, the current situation uh, for, is extremely stressful for all of us. We were just discussing now how, as medical professionals, we are finding it extremely stressful uh, because everything is changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Management, uh, diagnosis, everything is changing. So how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect patients? How do we protect our staff? All these things, in addition to our home life and in addition to, um, you know, whatever, uh, for instance, we don't have people to help at home. So cooking, cleaning, uh, all of that comes, falls on us. So it is a very stressful situation. Um, you can either be overwhelmed by it, like he said, it's a question of perception, or you can try and look at it in a different way and try and manage it, uh, try and deal with it in a way that is more manageable. And in fact, in a way that can perhaps make us stronger and better when we come out of this situation. So let us let me just share a few slides that I've uh, have for you. <clears throat> so um, yeah, what is stress? How does exercise help? How does stress affect our ability to exercise? This is really quite an important thing, and reading on it, you know, has given me also a lot of insight into uh, how people manage or do or don't exercise. What forms of exercise is better for stress management? Is there something such as too much exercise, which is also very relevant? And is there different, a difference between uh, exercise for men and women? And some of the common myths that we may face as we age. Okay, so this, uh, Dr. Krishnamurti has already explained to you, emotional distress causes what is called as neural hijacking, uh, meaning to say your brain is literally hijacked, where all you can do is fight or flight or freeze there are three things fight flight or freeze which is your response to the emotional distress that you face and this in turn can lead to impaired both thinking as well as perception the way you look at something and the way you think the process through can be altered simply because of the uh, neural hijacking that has happened and this in turn leads to what is called as maladaptive behavior so what that means is simply that you do things that are not necessarily good for you physically and mentally for instance you can eat too much how many of us reach for a packet of chips when we are stressed out for instance so you can eat too much you can drink you can smoke various other addictive behaviors um, all of these come under the realm of maladaptive behaviors which can uh, result from impaired thinking and perception and this maladaptive behavior can lead to poor outcomes such as diseases physical diseases like your diabetes hypertension uh, cardiac disease obesity all of those things and a poorer life experience we all know that when we are stressed and when we are anxious or if we suffer from disease obviously we are going to have a much poorer life experience so this is a vicious cycle 
because a poorer life experience can lead to emotional distress and that in turn leads to neural hijacking, fight, flight or freeze response, impaired thinking, maladaptive behavior, poor outcomes and it goes on and on. So where do we break this cycle? So that's what we're going to talk about and there are many modalities of which exercise is one. So one of the most important um, important conclusions, there are hundreds and hundreds of studies on stress and how exercise helps stress. At the bottom of it, the conclusion is that exercise essentially improves our resilience to stress. In other words, what we mean is that we are able to handle stress far better when we have used exercise as a form of therapy. Okay, so that's one of the most important uh, conclusions that one can come to. Although there are many physiological reasons why exercise helps, the main reason is that we are able, to, we become more resilient to stress. So the same event that um, could have stressed us out when we were not exercising will not stress us out when we have already incorporated exercise and other lifestyle, positive lifestyle habits into our life. So it improves life, uh, improves resilience. There are several, several studies which are talking about treatment of depression, exercise in the treatment of depression, exercise for stress reduction, exercise which reduces what is called as the sympathoadrenal response. In other words, what Dr. Krishnamurti talked about, you know, your, what is called as a uh, the link from the brain, the hypothalamo pituitary adrenal axis, which basically triggers our stress response, right? As soon as we see something like the snake or the tiger, as you're walking down the, uh, walking into, walking down the road, I mean, we're not going to do that, see a snake or, actually now we might, you know, we're seeing a lot of animals um, wandering around in the cities. But when we are stressed out by an event, uh, or an unexpected uh, happening, the typical response is the maladaptive uh, sympathoadrenal response, to which we can be more resilient if we have if we participate in exercise. And in this study, we talked only about aerobic exercise. So, in this cycle, you see that these are the problems that are faced as a result of. Uh, issues like anxiety, depress depression and cr chronic stress, post-traumatic st uh, stress disorder, etc. So the physical problems caused are anything from stroke, heart failure, cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, obesity, heart disease, etc, etc. So the cycle goes on and on because if, like I said, if you have a metabolic disorder or if you have a heart problem, you are likely to be stressed, you are likely to be depressed, you are likely to have uh, a, pro uh, a problem with perception, which in turn leads to maladaptive behavior and then furthering your, uh, your uh, physical complications. So there are several, several benefits of exercise. And if I had to go through the various, um, various categories of the benefits of exercise, it's endless. But I will just briefly say that um, one of the most important benefits of exercise besides the feel good, the feel good factor, which is uh, the emotional response, right? Relaxation, in positive emotion, less anxiety, calmness, optimism, etc. The most important thing is that regular exercise actually changes the physical, the, the physiology, the physical aspect of your brain. In other words, it, it changes your uh, neurons or your nerve cells and the connections between your ne neurons inside the brain. And this has been particularly found in two areas in the brain called the hippocampus and in the prefrontal cortex. So the hippocampus is the area for memory and the prefrontal cortex is the area for executive function or decision making. So these two areas seem to be um, seem to be seem to be affected positively by regular exercise simply because during regular exercise anybody who has exercised can tell you that there is an increased blood flow and an increased rate of breathing so there is better oxygenated blood that is going into the brain which in turn is improving that part of the brain so you can imagine when there is better quality of brain, especially in these two areas, memory and the prefrontal cortex, hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, obviously you're going to have a better quality of brain. 
So those are the physiological changes. Loss of fatty tissue, better immunity, etc., are the um, are the other side side benefits of uh, regular exercise. There are there is there are some behavioral benefits of exercise which one may not really uh, understand as benefits but these i i mean from both from personal experience as well as from dealing with clients i find that people who exercise on a regular basis have more positivity which means that they are they smile more they are more positive in their approach to other people they are more socially uh, they're socially more interactive and more positive towards other people these are things that come from a mood the mood enhancing um, mood en enhancing effect of regular exercise the other thing is that anybody who has exercised on a regular basis who gets up in the morning and goes for a run or goes for a walk knows that it takes a certain amount of self-discipline. So when you exercise self-discipline on a regular basis, it does something for you. It does something for your self-esteem. It does something for your self-confidence. You are you tell you, you are able to confirm to yourself, I can do this, even in times of stress, even in times that are not so great, even when everything else is not working out, I can still get up in the morning and do that, perform that half, uh, 30 minutes or 60 minutes of exercise. So in other words, that is the one area in your life where you can actually exercise some amount of control. Dr. Krishmuthi talked about the locus of control where, you know, in a time like this in COVID, we are we, are, we, we feel that we are not in control because we are not in control of this virus. But there is there are certain areas in our life, certain aspects of our life that we can, can control. And one of them is that one hour of exercise that we perform. Now, you may, may, you may say, oh, I can't go to the gym or I can't go out to exercise, but you can modify it. You can perform your exercises at home. And believe me, you can do it with zero equipment using your own body weight. So that is the one area of uh, area in your life, the one hour, 30 minutes that you can control. And that gives you a certain sense of self, uh, what is called as, it may be a form of self-actualization or a form of self uh, uh, self-confidence that makes you feel better, therefore increasing positivity. Obviously, the physical benefits are weight loss, better sleep, better bowel habits, you're stronger, you're more flexible, you have more stamina. And socially, um, and I think this is actually more pertaining more to women, uh, we find that social interaction improves because women typically like to um, exercise in groups, they enjoy group activities, so social interaction improves, social intelligent imp intelligence improves, and degree of motivation improves when you uh, uh, perform exercises in group sessions. So what are the effects, like I, uh, uh, Dr. Krishnamurti had also mentioned, what does stress do to your ability to exercise? And this is really important. So there was this study that was done where they kind of explored how does stress itself expo uh, uh, impact your ability to exercise. It definitely negatively impacts your ability to exercise. In other words, when you are highly stressed, when you are feeling negative emotions, you don't necessarily want to go out for a walk. You don't necessarily want to go and join that class because you've already started anticipating that the class is going to be difficult or your walk is going to be difficult, you're not going to be able to do it and so on and so forth because you have a sense of helplessness. So if any of you are feeling these emotions of not being able to, I don't feel like doing it, or I don't, you know, I don't think I'm able to do it, don't beat yourself up. It is a result of the stressful situation, but also understand that you can get around it by putting in, if not 100% of your effort, at least 10 to 20% of your effort. So, so what I'm trying to say is that very often people who are depressed, people who are stressed are not able to perform or uh, follow the recommendations that have been given, such as exercise for 45 minutes every day. And then they feel bad because they've not followed through and then they don't do anything at all. So that's counterproductive. 
instead why don't you stop and try with starting with just five to ten minutes a day and it doesn't have to be a very uh, very intense kind of exercise which is uncomfortable it can be something as simple as a slow walk so give yourself that little bit of space and a little bit of uh, uh, allow yourself the uh, indulgence if i if i can put it like that allow yourself that indulgence when you are highly stressed and exercise at a much lower intensity in fact sometimes what you will find is when you start to exercise even if it's at a lower intensity after you get into it for a, for the first 5 to 10 minutes you will start to feel more motivated to exercise further so there was this, uh, there was this, which we, which uh, Dr. Krish and I uh, discussed. How much exercise is too much? Is there a limit? Is there, is 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 there something like too much exercise? And it goes back to uh, this guy called uh, Philippides, or however you pronounce his name, from who the word marathon. Uh, arose he ran from the place marathon to greece which was about 26 miles and uh, promptly f um, died he promptly dropped dead and from there the word marathon uh, came up and uh, subsequently we have the very famous jim fix or jim 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 uh, uh, james fix um, as uh, he was uh, called who wrote uh, not just this complete book of running but a couple of other books as well who was very very famous for his uh, for being a marathon runner and uh, it, it it so happened that unfortunately he actually dropped dead at the age of 52 uh, while he was running so then there are these there are a whole lot of these um, you know you see it in the news and you watch it uh, you know you watch uh, you read uh, about people who die suddenly while exercising or while running and so there is this anxiety that can you just suddenly drop dead while exercising does exercise itself cause sudden death so uh, well it can if you have a pre-existing heart condition as was suspected of gym fix you know on analysis it was found that he did have symptoms he did have symptoms of chest pain he did, he was very uncomfortable but he ran through all of that which and possibly he could have had a pre-existing heart condition which caused him to uh, die suddenly during his run so it's not that exercise itself will precipitate death but if you have a pre-existing heart condition or pre-existing uh, physical problem you it can be aggravated if you stress your body by Obviously, uh, any form of exercise will increase heart rate, breathing, etc. And if you stress your body out, it can actually um, precipitate, a, precipitate a sudden event. So the advice would be, especially if you are over 40, please do have a medical checkup. Please do have a thorough medical before you start exercising, especially if you are starting for the first time after 40 if you are if you have been exercising all your life a teenager who's you know been highly athletic and is continuing to exercise there is not the, the concern is not so great but if you're starting late please do uh, please keep in mind that you do have to go through your medical uh, before you start to exercise so uh, there is somebody going i mean just taking this a little further there is some some there is a term called the obligate runner uh, these are people who are extremely addicted, so to speak, to uh, running or it could be it could be used for any form of exercise. Somebody who uses exercise as a form of um, as a form of literally finding meaning for themselves. Right. So and there are some, you know, in the article I was reading, there are some very um, there are uh, the, the kind of explanation that has been given is that they may be neurotically attached to their sport, whether it's running or whether it is any other form of exercise. And in other words, it can be a form of uh, addiction. Right. So but it has also Dr. been found that. Uh, Dr. Shira, sorry, can we wrap up in about three to five minutes? Yeah, sure, sure. So it was so it's it has been found that even though we find that even though there have been these instances of sudden death, uh, we the, it has been found that runners do have or runners or exercisers do have a 27% lower risk of dying during this study period that was uh, that uh, during which the study was done and running was associated with 30% 30, 30 lower risk of death. So 
Now, serious running is more than 40, 40 miles per week. And I mean, this is I'm talking about, you know, marathoners and people like that. Uh, recreational running is not more than 20 miles. Now, which form of exercise is better? Uh, yoga, Tai Chi. Yes, it is um, uh, yoga, Tai Chi. All these forms are what they call as mind body med uh, exercise. Uh, personally, uh, I would say that all forms of exercise have to be mind body because you really need to be mindful when you're exercising. But yes, yoga, Tai Chi, etc. do focus a lot on the breath and therefore it could be more relaxing. Weight training definitely is highly, uh, uh, can be highly de-stressing contrary to what people may think. Um, cardio, which is your uh, running, etc., etc., is also de-stressing. Uh, so in this study, they found that resistance training, which is nothing but exercise training, ex uh, weight training, is also can also be uh, de-stressing. What is the difference? And we can, uh, you know, I can answer questions on this. There are lots of differences between men and women, and we need to keep that in mind, especially those of us who are uh, uh, prescribing exercise. We have to keep in mind that men and ma women not only approach exercise differently, they respond differently to exercise, and they also experience exercise very, very differently. And in different ages, of course, there is a difference, but honestly, I don't think really it's the age that matters. It's the fitness level of the person that matters because I know many 40 year olds who are fitter than 20 and 30 year olds. And I know people who are in their 20s who are um, very, very unfit. So I don't think it's age per se, but it's really the fitness level that needs to be kept in mind when we prescribe exercise and we act, when we actually participate in exercise. So um, I hope that's just a very brief um, uh, run through about exercise and we can, I can take questions and uh, discuss further with uh, Dr. Krishnamurti. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sheila. Uh, request you to... Uh... And share yes yes share your questions and uh, uh, but you you are ready we are, I got a couple of questions which has already come to me we also want to chat back in the meanwhile uh, uh, Dr Krishnamurti do you have any question for Sheila Nambiar first choice viewers you or uh, shall we go ahead with the question which has come from the people maybe we will start with the people and then we can come back to the uh, uh, to some of the core questions that I have just yeah. a few. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think your presentation is very clear and thought-provoking and people would have really understood. Uh, some of the questions which has come from uh, YouTube, I'll just share with you. Quite a number of them have come to me. What makes you fat and how fat is fat in Indian context? Is it fashionable to be thin? Well, what makes you fat is if you just look at it, a very, it in a very simplistic way, it is calories in and calories out. Okay, it's amount of energy that you expend versus the energy amount of energy that you consume. That's the baseline of what makes you fat. But uh, hormones play an important role. Uh, the mental makeup may, plays an important role. Sleep plays an important role. Uh, so it's a it's a discussion that can go on and on. What is what did what was the second part of the question in the Indian is context? It's fashionable to be looking thin, actually. Why? Why? Is it sure. fashionable? No, not at all. I think it is. It's highly fashionable to be fit, not thin, because thin thin doesn't equate fitness, and thin doesn't mean that you can escape the diseases. Because there are many thin people who have all the metabolic diseases yes. that we've already described. So it's not thinness, but fitness that's important. Super, madam. There's a question from Mr. Vasudevan to Mr. Krishna, Dr. Krishnamurti. So will not the modification of expectations itself cause stress? How do you handle this? I think that's a, it's an excellent question. Uh, and I think that that is the, the mountain that we all have to climb. Because sometimes the situation is not uh, one that is amenable to modification. COVID-19 is a very good example. We have uh, the locus of control is completely outside. It is with the experts, it's with the government. We cannot decide what we want to do ourselves. So which then means that we have to modify our expectations suitably. And one of the first, I, I completely agree with Mr. Vasudevan that that's the biggest mountain to climb, that I'm willing to embrace my reality and I'm willing to modify my expectations to suit that new reality. Um, and I think that that's what most of us struggle with when we lose uh, sleep, uh, nights of sleep. Uh, or when we go through, uh, you know, buckets of sweat, it's because we have not embraced the reality yet. 
and I think that that's that's very true. But it's it want to be done. Super sir, there's a question from uh, Free Sense editor. He's a national e magazine. He says how the yoga and pranayama helps to reduce your stress. If it uh, it's been proved, it does, or it's a uh, more of a myth. Um, it does definitely, most definitely does. Uh, the simple act of deep breathing stimulates what's called as the parasympathetic nervous system, okay, which is a part of the nervous system that calms us down. It 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 read it's the opposite of the fight or flight response. So a simple thing like deep breathing can stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system and lower the physiological responses to stress. Like Dr. St uh, Krishnamurti already explained, stress basically increases your heart rate, it increases your bleeding, breathing, it directs the blood to the uh, muscles and uh, there is neural hijacking and the opposite of that is what the parasympathetic nervous system does and the stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system can be uh, can be uh, helped along using something as simple as deep breathing which is very much a part of yoga and pranayam if i can add yes. to that yes sir. there is uh, yes. a lot of published research today including from the national institute of mental health and neurosciences bangalore on the benefits of yoga for mental yeah. health. Yeah. Uh, and one of the demonstrations of that research is that when you engage in yogic practices, uh, there are changes in your brain on brain scans, what we call functional brain imaging or functional yeah. MRI. Yeah. There are actual changes in the brain when you have practiced those exercises on, uh, you know, and as you continue to practice. So uh, I think uh, asking for proof that yoga helps is something uh, perhaps very unwise uh, to do anymore. Enough research today to, to tell us that. Absolutely, I agree, sir. No, nothing. I, I can't be you know, more than agreeing. And I also know that uh, in Siachen Glacier, where the temperature is minus 40 degrees, yoga and pranayam is one of the kind of things which is given to all the soldiers there. And, the thing. and I've seen uh, it's really uh, done quite a bit of uh, goodness to them. So there is also a question from uh, thing. Is there any connection between stress and uh, incurring uh, no, uh, diabetes? Uh, how do you overcome this? And what is the indication? The stress which is ultimately going to lead you to diabetes. Now, Sheila, would you take that? Yeah. Well, um, uh, stress by itself, as we said, there is something called maladaptive behavior to stress, which means that when you are stressed out, you're not thinking straight. You're not able to adjust your behavior in a way that you would perhaps like to address your behavior. So then you, you may do many things such as eat a lot and all the wrong kind of food. You may not exercise regularly as a result of which you may. And besides drinking, smoking, etc, etc. Uh, as a result of which you start to gain weight and you start to your cholesterol levels and all the biochemistry in your body is altered which in turn leads to diabetes so it's not stress directly causing uh, uh, diabetes it is the it is the result of the behavior to the stress the response to the stress which means that when you break that cycle your response to the stress if that's altered then you can also alter the outcome you don't necessarily have to get the diabetes or, uh, for that matter, any other disease that can um, that can occur as a result of the stress. Would like to add anything? Uh, uh, warning signs also, if I might add, many of our patients, uh, an abrupt loss of weight in someone, uh, they attribute it to exercise, mm -hmm. not realizing that they have actually oh. developed diabetes. Uh, in diabetes, you lose weight and muscle mass. In diabetes also, you go through periods of intense hunger and there's a lot of fatigue. These are all early warning signs of diabetes. And sometimes people who started exercising start attributing the, these symptoms to their exercise, thinking that they are doing something right when in fact. So Dr. Sheila's uh, uh, you know, very important message, especially if you're uh, you know, 40 and above and you're starting to exercise, have a proper medical check so that you know uh, what physiology you are employing. Uh, that's probably very, very important. There's a question from uh, Lakshmi TK. Yoga beyond asanas has to be perceived. Pranayama is perceived very falsely in the society today. What's your views on this? Um, probably I should take that because we, we uh, do yes, practice yoga yes. in all our centers. Yes, sir. Um, 
I, I, I think that unfortunately what has happened over years is that there are authentic practitioners and non-authentic practitioners of yoga like everything else. And therefore, there's a lot of misinformation that has also crept into the system. And there's also a lot of skepticism that comes in people's minds. But uh, I think authentically practiced yoga, uh, it is usually prescribed for an individual based on their requirement. Because please don't forget that yoga comes from Ayurveda. And Ayurveda talks about Prakriti, your individual constitution and what your constitution needs. So it is not a standard yoga practice for everyone. Yoga has to be prescribed for an individual based on their health, based on their system, based on their needs. And that requires a little bit of an understanding and an assessment. Uh, so I think the person is very right in, in pointing it out. And I think there, there definitely, like everything else, there's a need for experts. Great, great insight, sir. Uh, there's a question again to you, sir. Can you explain mindfulness and how it can be applied during the COVID-19 pandemic? Certainly. So mindfulness as a, a thought process or a technique is about focusing your energies on, uh, you know, one thing. For example, many mindful practices start with uh, being able to assess your own breath and being able to focus on your breathing. And when you do that, you become more and more self-aware. That is the essence of mindfulness, improving your self-awareness by focusing increasingly inwards and diminishing the impact of your surroundings and environment. And certainly, yes, I think during a, a time like COVID when everything is so disrupted, uh, uh, mindfulness is, is a very, very uh, useful and important uh, tool and technique that people can employ. Uh, again, there are people who are authentic and a lot of non-authentic information out there. So one has to be cautious uh, in picking the right and authentic uh, source of information on how to do this. There is a question from one of the YouTube viewers. We talk so much about nutrition and uh, optimal uh, you know, supplements what should be taken. So much is being promoted. Do you think the supplements is an essential today for all age group? Because when you go to the gym, first thing they give me a protein supplement. I also want to know, ask the subject questions coming on protein. So what do you use on the supplements and how essential it is for the people to take supplements on nutrition? Yeah, I'm sorry, the light seems to be... Uh, but I'm no, ma'am. The audio is clear. Good. Yeah, we are able to see you, no problem. Okay, okay. So I'm going to answer. Um, there are certain supplements that may be... Sorry, you're not only visible, but uh, the lighting makes it very look very surreal. Oh, really? Okay. Studio, studio has effect, man. Okay. Uh, uh, see, as far as supplements go, I think there may be some supplements that may be required. For instance, if you are low on vitamin D, B12, these are supplements that zinc. These are supplements that may definitely be required. But protein um, supplements uh, are highly overrated, in my opinion. They're highly overrated. I, uh, all, you require, all you need, even as a bodybuilder, is about 1, 1 to 1 1.5 milligram per kg body weight of protein. And that can very easily be obtained even on a vegan diet. You don't necessarily even need to eat meat or milk and milk products. Even on a vegan diet, you can definitely achieve the amount of protein that's required. Personally, I don't think protein supplements are, are necessary. Um, the other supplements depends entirely on your deficiency. I don't think you need to, uh, you know, ran, um, randomly prescribe supplements to everybody. If you are deficient in vitamin D, which many people are, you definitely need the vitamin D or vitamin B12. If you are a vegetarian, vegan, you may be deficient in B12. So I think it requires some more investigations before you prescribe uh, supplements. There's a question from Mr. Vasudevan to Dr. Sorry, Sheila. Sorry. Yes, sir. Please, please go ahead, Dr. Sir. We do have young people coming to clinic uh, who start showing symptoms of anger and explosive temper. Uh, With steroids? After they start taking supplements. Yeah. In fact, we don't know they've started taking supplements. There's a sudden change in the person's personality. And this is someone who previously has not been demonstrating such symptoms. Uh, and then when we question them, we realize they've started going somewhere, like to a gym, 
uh, maybe training in weights or whatever. But the additional thing is someone's given them a supplement, often uh, over the counter whey protein supplement. So one of the cautions for uh, uh, you know with, with young people is, uh, and I think anyone is, you need to be aware of what a supplement can do to you beyond uh, help you build muscle mass. Uh, I, think, sir, I think whenever youngsters get angry, I'm a check. Are you taking supplements? I think uh, <laughs> there's a lot of correlation between the both, sir. Uh, there's also a question uh, from uh, how much of water one should drink? So much of thing you are, you keep hydrated, keep drinking water. What, what is the limit? How many? Somebody say one liter, somebody say two liters. What is it exactly you should be drinking? See, water the, level. The, 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 the theory that eight glasses of water a day. Um, I don't think it holds good. It's not written in stone for everyone because it again depends on where do you live. Do you live in a place where you're sweating a lot? Then you would need a lot more water than eight glasses. If you live in a place like where I live in Uti, we have to force ourselves to drink eight glasses of water. You see, so it depends a lot on if you're exercising a lot, you, do need, you need to consume more water. But on average... Um, I don't, I mean, I have not come up with any studies which, uh, read any studies which give you the exact number of glasses or liters of water that need to be drunk. I think a lot of it depends on what you, you're doing, where you live, how much you are sweating, um, you know, the, the, the uh, water loss from your body. Depending on that, you will need to consume and replenish your body. Your body was, is actually very intelligent. It gives you signals of thirst uh, and uh, signals that you need to consume a little more. So, and water is not just water. It comes from the watery vegetables, for instance, fruit, watery vegetables, etc. You're, you're getting your hydration from there as well. Excellent. Ma There's a question again to Dr. Sheila. Does anxiety and stress always go together? Are the reasons, symptoms, or third impact or outcome? The same for both anxiety and stress. What's your views on? I think that's a question more for Dr. Trish. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they can go, right? Well, what, what do you say? They, they, they do often do. I, I would look at it like this, that we look at stress as a very generic term. We all say I'm stressed out. Uh, anxiety is one of the symptoms of stress. Uh, so when you feel anxious or having attacks of panic, then that's a very important symptom of stress. Other important symptoms of stress are repetitive thoughts, uh, worry, uh, 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 you know, getting depressed, <clears throat> becoming forgetful and absent-minded. All these things can be symptoms of stress. Uh, but anxiety is a very important symptom of stress and one of the most common ones that brings people to doctors and psychologists. Yeah. Just to add to that, um, you know, I've had patients come to me with where their attenders uh, not so much the patient, the attender, you know, complains almost that the patient is worrying all the time. For instance, in this time of COVID, you know, the patient, I've had uh, patients who've delivered or they're the, when they are in their antenatal period, the mother or the mother-in-law says that the woman is extremely worried uh, about her baby. She is extremely paranoid that, you know, there are people who will come and visit and, uh, you know, touch the baby and then the social distancing has been, has not been practiced, etc. So the, the parents or the family tends to look at it as a form of paranoia. So that, that is anxiety and that is, that is brought about by the stress, the very stress of the situation that we are in. So yeah, trigger anxiety can most definitely be triggered by a stressful situation. There's a question on uh, the balanced, from one of our Facebook uh, viewer, the balanced health and taste and the food habits. How much calorie is ideal for today, especially when COVID-19, we are locked up at home. What do you think is the... No ideal calorie one, one should be intake to the present situation. Going forward, I, how do you make this as a habit that you start controlling your food? Yeah, well, the, 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 the technically to calculate calories, you take into account the gender of the person, the activity of the person. Uh, and uh, depending on that, you will you multiply it by a certain value and you calculate it. So it differs from person to person. 
right? Most definitely your calorie intake needs to decrease if your activity level is decreased. So if you're sitting at home and, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of movement that you have is decreased, the intake has to be decreased. But personally, honestly, personally, I never count calories. And I don't advise my clients and patients to count calories because it's not an exact science. So um, I think if you are mindful here, the mindfulness part comes in. If you are mindful of your consumption and the way your body is responding to food, you will understand when you are full. You will understand when you are eating too much. Your body is a very intelligent thing. It's a very, very intelligent piece of equipment, if I can put it like that. Uh, you don't really need to calculate calories. You can literally, by being mindful of your consumption and your expen energy expenditure, understand that you are, you are eating too much or you're not moving enough. So calorie, uh, calculating calories is possible. Uh, again, depending on gender, depending on age, depending on uh, depending on activity levels, and it differs from person to person, differs from sex uh, between men and women. Men need more calories than women, um, and it needs to be decreased in a time when you are not exercising or moving around as much as it as we are not now. Krish, you would like to add uh, that means a stress and mindfulness uh, also add to your burning your calories. Would you like to add uh, something on those uh, lines? Uh, sorry, was that to me? <clears throat> yes. You would like to add uh, anything more to this? Like, oh, yes. Um, I think being mindful of one's diet uh, is extremely important. And uh, one of the things that you will notice among uh, uh, people, of course, of a certain age, but who are achievers, a very good example that comes to mind is G.D. Birla. It is, it is said in his biography that he would end his day, his last meal before 7 p.m., 6.30 p.m. in fact. So if he was ever invited to any function, he would insist on leaving by 6.30 p.m. and he would only have a glass of milk uh, in the function so that he doesn't offend his host. Um, in a sense, therefore, being mindful of one's diet, setting some rules that one tries to follow, um, uh, and per perhaps trying to achieve a level of predictability is extremely important. In fact, in that, I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, add a question from the chat. So, uh, this is to Dr. Sheila. Someone's asked, I, I, you know, I keep trying to set up these new habits, but nothing lasts. I kind of give up after a while. So how do you make exercise or diet or anything that should enhance your fitness and reduce your stress levels how do you make that a habit? It's a very good question from someone. It's, very good. it's a very good question and it's something that comes up over and over again. Firstly, you need to kind of stop and ask yourself if the goal that you are setting is the right one. Because sometimes we do set unrealistic goals and then we start out very, very enthusiastic and then it fizzles out because perhaps our body is not able to cope. We are not able to cope with the time that we have. We may plan to work out for one hour a day when actually that kind of uh, time, you're not, you, you don't have the luxury of that kind of time. So firstly, the goal that you set needs to be very realistic. Secondly, I think it's very, very important to have somebody, especially in the first few months or the, maybe for the first three to six months, it's good to have somebody by your side to motivate and guide you. Somebody who's qualified, somebody who's professional. Because today's, in today's world with the internet, every day you read something new. And every day you have something that seems more exciting than the previous one. So I think having a motivator who is a motivator and a guide and a professional who is well qualified is extremely important. And if they, if they are able to guide you through your first six months, um, and help you understand that this is a lifestyle. This is not something you do for three months or six months. Whether it is how much you eat and or how much you exercise, you have to understand that it is a lifestyle. It's not difficult. It's something that many people who have managed to um, absorb and internalize this lifestyle have done. It's not difficult, but it has to be tailored to your needs. And for that, you do need somebody who's a good guide and a good motivator. I think that's important. Well, there's a question from Mr. Narsimulu. 
it is slightly to pressure on time it compromises on regular exercise and people in regular travel regular exercise get affected can you suggest some exercise which can be practiced on regularly i think you should join your studio simple <laughs> anyway this question is uh, would you like to give some exercise tips you would like to do when he when he's on well, track what all i can say is that you don't need to exercise for hours on end even 20 minutes a day is all that's required and in those 20 minutes even doing something like surya namaskars in your hotel room that's all that's required so something like something is better than nothing most people uh, uh what they do is if they are not able to fit in the one hour that they plan to they give it up altogether so instead if you can even attempt to do 10 to 20 10 to 15 20 minutes even in your hotel room that's all that's required um and uh, going for a walk even for 10 minutes 10 minutes three times a day instead of 30 minutes at a stretch so you have what's called as exercise snacking which is you know few 10 minutes three times instead of three uh, 30 whole minutes that's more than that it actually works really really well so um what is recommended is 30 minutes three times a week and that's not at all easy to i mean that's not at all difficult to follow so uh, it can be followed at you know i mean i think pretty much anybody can follow that you have 24 hours in a day so 30 minutes is not difficult yes i should come did you yes would like to add sir please go ahead now add a little psychological tip to this uh, if you have a health app on your phone most of us have smartphones uh, and check it every day uh, that's enough to give you enough guilt motivation uh, and motivation that you are not doing what you should, should have been doing i think this is one and the second is you know i recently found myself traveling a lot and basically what i started doing was walking in the airport yeah most airports have long concourses where you can walk and yeah. walk is about time it's not about distance uh, the distance automatically happens it's how long how much time you spent walking today and the third is climb a flight of stairs don't take the lift uh you know uh, walk to the shops don't take your car or your scooter uh, i think these are things that all of us can do so i think it's it's it's, it's actually a mindset change uh once you start telling yourself i have to exercise then you find the ways to do it uh, very often it's the mindset that's the problem is the technology helps sir your uh, smartphone really tells you what you are doing what your heart beat what your sleeping rate all that i think uh, people should use that uh, technology very effectively yeah the simple question, thing like a step a simple thing like a step you know many people have a fitbit the like a watch yeah. that you wear around which you know which can be yeah. extremely useful uh, and an average of 10000 steps a day uh it's not written in stone but if you can't if you set an average of 10000 steps a day you will be ensured of uh, moving quite a bit through the day yes, fact, i just ask an additional question from the chat it's an interesting one i see obese people who are very stress free this is dr sunil from bangalore i see very obese people who are stress free and then i see these very fit people who are highly stressed out so you know uh, is it exercise is it yoga is it is it the mind dr shila it's a combination of everything krish i i can most definitely agree with what he says um but on the other hand i must also say appearances are not everything people can look stress free and may be extremely stressed right so we can't go by appearances but having said that it doesn't mean that just because you're physically fit you are mentally stress free you they are they are they have to be i think relief of stress and managing stress has to be managed has to be actually worked on it doesn't come automatically yes exercise definitely helps you are put in a positive frame of mind so you are able to implement the positive modalities to manage your stress uh but you have to do that it doesn't automatically happen and people who are obese you know some people do have a a you know very carefree attitude it's your per- maybe a personality a type so um you know it doesn't mean that just because you are obese although the research does show that depression is more common in people who are obese uh it doesn't mean that it everybody who is obese has to be depressed or stressed out thank you madam i think we got another 10 minutes we'll try and squeeze in as many questions as possible there's a question from vijay lakshmi uh morning walk or evening walk which is better to reduce weight and add on to that also 
uh, which is better a daily exercise jogging or walking or can we do both yoga and physical exercise multiple questions okay so you okay your the, the best time to exercise is the time that suits you so which means that you have to work it into your life so somebody telling you walk in the morning or walk in the evening may not may not be suitable for you because maybe you go in for an early morning you're going to work early in the morning so if it suits you the time that suits you you have to work that into your life and can you what is the second part of it can you exercise in yes uh, running and gymming uh, exercise concurrently you can do it both in the morning exercise running can, and of course you can of course you can if you have one hour you can use 20 minutes for cardio and 40 minutes for uh, weight training um, definitely most certainly you can the, doc, the question of dr sunil is there any blood test lab test to know whether someone has anxiety including disorder and and the magnitude of it madam is there any so that people can try to check their stress or not stress so there are tests to measure anxiety but they are not blood tests uh, they tend to be questionnaires there are some electrophysiological tests that will tell us whether you are anxious or not it, it, these are how you are responding to your environment type of tests uh, which can be done but there isn't a blood test however i must point out most people who come to us with mental health symptoms there are things that we look at for example today i had someone who was experiencing sudden anxiety and panic and this started the post the lockdown now i could have easily concluded it was the lockdown but i did one of the tests that i always do for such people i checked their thyroid levels and i found that she had very abnormal thyroid levels now thyroid problems can for example be responsible for stress yeah. so it's very very important therefore to uh again going back to what dr sheila said not just before exercise but when you experience a new symptom even if it is a mental health symptom it's very important to rule out physiological causes uh because uh, that can be the reason why you are having a new symptom uh so diabetes is an example thyroid is another thing there is a question regarding alcohol now with the covid lockdown Customer came in shop. People are being found. When it's open, there's a tremendous rush to get alcohol. Now people got used to it. Do you mean, sir, alcohol is it good for health or bad for health? Because I know people drink. And there also one question is: uh, drinking wine does it add good to your health? People say you drink wine, uh, you don't get uh, BP or sugar. I don't know how far. Is how, how do we? What is your advice to people uh, post COVID? If to stay out of alcohol because they already got habituated uh, staying for almost 50 days without alcohol this is very very important for the people watching um see according to according to oh, the medical advice uh, women are allowed three drinks per week okay three single drinks per week and men are allowed not more than four to five maximum drinks per week so now it doesn't mean that it improves your health it just means that that is the outer limit now if you're if during covid or otherwise if you are consuming more than that most certainly it is it is detrimental to health it is detrimental to alcoholic fatty liver you know besides many other things obesity etc etc uh, uh, it is definitely detrimental to health and uh, I wasn't aware that the Tasmac shops were open during COVID. That's news to me. <laughs> Some places it got open. Some will not in Chennai. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that seems to be a kilometer skews in one of the cities. If okay. I can add, if I can add something there. Yes, sir. The, uh, you know the the whole story of alcohol being good for you came from research in the Mediterranean region, and this was to do with actually red wine. yeah because mm. there is a there is a, a practice of consuming red wine with the meal um but what people did not take into account was the meal in the mediterranean region was extremely healthy it was cooked with olive oil it uh, it had uh, uh, spices it did not have very much of red meat uh, it was filled with vegetables and so on and the other thing is in the mediterranean region the lifestyle is very complementary to that people have two to three hour lunches and then take a siesta uh, so in a sense therefore they didn't account for those effects on your brain health they only accounted for the consumption of red wine on brain health 
The long and short story is therefore <clears throat> that yes, specific kinds of alcohol, not all forms of alcohol, specific kinds of alcohol, especially red wine consumed in moderation, and Dr. Sheila has given us some numbers, are probably good for you. Probably, you yeah. Have a protector effect on you. Yeah. But the most yeah, people really have happy. a license uh, yes. to, to consume way more than they should. And yeah. that usually leads to problems, what we call hold, hypertension, obesity, lipid disorders, that is high cholesterol, and diabetes. So if you want to hold, hold, then you shouldn't be drinking in excess. You need to drink in great moderation. Uh, and the, the limits that Dr. Sheila said, uh, those limits should be maintained on a daily basis. Some people think that though that's <coughs> well, it's not, uh, it's your weekly limit. Four or three is a weekly limit. It's not your daily limit. Some people assume it's a daily limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you, and also you cannot accumulate it and binge drink. That's the other thing. Catch up of the last time. There's also a question from uh, to doctor is please guide us uh, which are the foods that are uh, suitable for a diabetic patients. Uh, which are the foods? Fruits, 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 fruits. 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 Yes. Um, certain fruits are called high glycemic fruits, which means that they spike the blood sugar very, very uh, quickly. So those fruits like watermelon, uh, mangoes. Um, very sweet fruits like dates, grapes, etc. need to be kept to the minimum. Fruits like citrus fruits, kiwis, berries, uh, pears, apples, these are all can be consumed, you know, without any uh, problem. Uh, but I have also seen that in general, fruits are really not a problem at all. Even if you do consume mangoes and you do consume in moderation, obviously, you can't have five mangoes and expect, you know, everything to be fine. But in moderation, I find that fruits are really not such a problem even for a diabetic because the kind of sugar that's in the fruit is very different from your table sugar, uh, which is sucrose, right? So that's very different. And if you eat the whole fruit as opposed to juice, uh, of it, juice is definitely not recommended. The whole fruit is far more beneficial because it has the fiber as well. So absorption of the sugar is much less. Super, sir. Uh, doctor, would like to uh, Association has a very simple recommendation. Dry fruits are better than uh, fresh fruits because they're, they have dropped their uh, sugar content is one of the recommendations in that website. I'm quoting the website, not myself. But also a small serving bowl of fruit per day is what is recommended for a diabetic. So, which website uh, is this, Krish? Sorry? Which website is this? ADA, the American Diabetic Association. Oh, okay. Uh, so, a small serving <clears throat> bowl of uh, uh, fruit, what you call a kingdom, is probably what is allowed per day. There's a question from Mr. Ashwin, sir. He says, for the people uh, with chronic respiratory problems, is it advisable to have a curd or buttermilk as a part of the meal because it is said it aids digestion. Some doctors advise that curd or buttermilk lead to chest conditions. Uh, uh, what's your view on this? Because buttermilk is a way of life for Tamil guys. <laughs> um, if I can just... Uh, um, milk and milk products have been found to be pro-inflammatory. Inflammatory. Uh, I know a lot of the uh, Ayurveda and all these... Uh, forms of uh, ancient sciences don't recommend milk and milk products. In lifestyle medicine, which is what I practice, we don't recommend milk and milk products uh, because they are pro-inflammatory and uh, we, are, or we may not be aware of this, but many people, many Indians are also lactose intolerant, which means that they will react adversely to milk or milk products, whether it's curd or anything else. There are many substitutes like plant milks, which are like oat milk, peanut milk, cashew milk, coconut milk, etc. And uh, it can be tried. Personally, I don't recommend milk and milk products. Yes, would like to add uh, anything more to Dr. Krish? Uh, I'll go to the next I question. Pass on that one. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, you know, you all watching the chat, the people are so appreciative of your thing. The one more question has come, Mr. Uh, who's our YouTube uh, viewer, Narayan Ramesh. Stressed out, depressed. Please differentiate uh, and walking after dinner, is it okay? Is it, uh, does it add, add good to your uh, thing, you know, walking after dinner? 
So I'll that's do the stressed out and depressed. Yes. yes. And then I let the Doxila do the walking after dinner. So the stressed out versus depressed. Stressed out is a very generic term to to say that you are experiencing that emotional overload. Depressed is more specific that your mood is low. Uh, you're not feeling positive or confident about yourself, the world, and the future. Uh, and persistently feeling that way, having negative emotions about the world, self, and the future for more than about two weeks, is then something that we say is a sign of being depressed in a kind of a concerning way. Uh, so I think that's the difference, uh, you know, and uh, depression is one symptom of stress. Uh, Dr. Sheila, about the walk. Um, yes, you can walk after dinner. Uh, in fact, it's extremely helpful to control your blood sugars and you, uh, to uh, even help digest your food. But please don't do a very, a very uh, fast walk. It should be a more of a leisurely walk for about 15 to 20 minutes is more than sufficient. So most certainly, yes, don't uh, sit down or lie down immediately after your dinner. It's far better to go for a short walk after dinner or right. anything for that matter. I will excuse in two more so, questions before we let you go, madam. And... Uh... The first question is, what would be the motivating words I could say to myself every morning to get myself to do exercise and get going for the day? You can do it. <laughs> Dr. You Chris? can do it or I can do it would probably be the uh, most motivating because you know what? You really can. Everybody can. So just telling yourself that you can do it. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it does doesn't have to be so intense that you know you are uncomfortable. It can be start. You you can start it at a much lower intensity. But just telling yourself that you can do it is more than sufficient. Yes, you can do it. Yes, yes. I can do it, or you can do I'll it. I'll add a little technique to that. So look at the mirror. Say I can do it, and I'll come back and look at you hot and sweaty. <laughs> That's a good one. Now music and relaxation. A LC stress management tool and uh, why and how music aids relaxation. Many people say, okay, you are relaxed, go and you know, learn some instrument, maybe piano or violin, some instrument you learn, I think it puts you to ease. Is it true, sir? It, music and relaxation? Uh, very interesting question. Uh, I want to make three points. One is that practicing a form of music itself is a kind of mindfulness. Uh, when you learn to play an instrument, when you learn to sing a particular tune or a raga, that itself is a form of mindfulness. It focuses your mind on one thing. It reduces your distractions from the outside world. The, the second, music is something that we have culturally grown up with. It is not just in our own environment. It is there in our collective consciousness. Third, Music is so closely associated with our memories. It is so closely associated with our emotions. To give you a simple example, when you hear Janagana Mana, you feel that. You feel that uh, pride, that, that rush. So therefore, music obviously is very uplifting. It can be very stress relieving. And it is something definitely that people who feel that they are getting stressed out can take up. Uh, it's also cognitively excellent because as we get to middle age, uh, we are not using our brain neurons optimally and we tend to forget things. Learning a new instrument, learning new pieces of music, learning to store them, learning to replicate them because the Indian tradition of music is an oral tradition. You, you listen and learn. There's, no, there's nothing written in front of you. All of this is excellent for not just the mind but also the brain. So heartily recommended. Super, sir. And, uh, Thank you. And, that was wonderful. Yes. That's one more uh, question. Because why this question is very important. During this uh, even the lockdown period, uh, so many music webinars and uh, so many music, uh, you know, I, I see in television. In the MMA also, we organized one musical webinar in the evening where we got in a couple of singers to sing along with the members. And uh, that was a good hit, actually, sir. I think your insight was great, sir. Man, one last question to Sheila, madam, actually, is how women can reduce stress and stay healthy? Uh, yeah, one piece of advice, what you are parting advice to the women folks, actually. I think you should start to exercise. Honestly, 
I think you should just start to exercise. Just go for a walk, even 30 minutes a day, and you'll find the difference is remarkable. And I've seen this over and over again in my patients and clients. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be a strenuous or stressful walk at your own pace. 30 minutes a day, split it up into two if that's what it takes for you. But exercise is definitely the way to go. And walking is so simple, you don't, you don't have to learn anything. So start with just walking and then you'll start getting interested in doing many more things with your body. The supplementary question, madam, just to add on to this one, Lee. Now with the COVID lockdown, the way of uh, working is changed. Work from home has become an order of the day. When you work from home, the stress for women is much more than when they go to work and come back. So how do you, what is your one advice uh, for the people work from home or work for home? This is a question seriously impacting the women actually. So they take most of the responsibility at home. Still, yes, uh, they do. So how do you, how do you, what is one advice? How do they, how do you make them mentally fit enough to face this uh, concept of work from home? Again, yeah, it is much more stressful because like you said, they do not only work from home, they also take on much of the other responsibilities like the cooking and the cleaning and taking care of the kids and so on. So, and they have no time away from this family, which can be extremely stressful. And I think in many homes there are joint families, you know, in-laws, etc., etc. <clears throat> I don't know what advice I can give except... Try and take some time for yourself, even if it is just 15 to 20 minutes where you can close the door and spend some time with yourself uh, doing even simple Surya Namaskars, Pranayams, etc. Uh, it will help you to center, it will help you to cope with the rest of your uh, day. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to have a garden outside or even a terrace or even stairs, stairs which you can walk up and down, do that for about 10 to 15 minutes because again, that improves your positivity and you're able to cope better. Um, if you can spend, I think spending a little time by yourself is important, 15 to 20 minutes, just by yourself, where you're not surrounded by other people. That Excellent, ma'am. Dr. Krishna, we would like to have a parting word of advice to the women folks who work from home, how to reduce their stress. Absolutely. In fact, I have had this complaint from patients of mine in the last two or three weeks. And I think the, the thing I would say is adhere to your old schedule. You used to leave home and go to work. And you did certain chores at home before you left to work. You did, did certain chores at home after you came from work. Don't allow people around you to think that you will continue to do chores just because you're sitting at home, because you're at work. Sure. Uh, you're not at home. Technically, you're, you're at work, even though you may be sitting at home. I think this is one. So a schedule is very important, not just for women folk. It's important for all of us. During COVID, have a daily schedule. This is very important. Like Dr. Sheila said, uh, the I can do it and regular exercise is very important. Uh, me time, not getting caught into uh, not knowing how the day went. Having a, a nice uh, schedule to the day and having me time where you reflect on what you're doing Think about what you're doing. Stay positive. Motivate yourself. Uh, take a problem-solving approach to what you are facing. Stress is undeniable. We all are having stress. So Super. the me time is very, very important. Finally, with words, Manadil Uridi Vendum, Vaki Nele Inimai Vendum, Ninaivu Nalla the Vendum, Neringina Purul Kaipada Vendum, Taramum Inpamum Vendum, Tarini Le Pirumai Vendum. Super. So I think we, we need to stay positive. We need to take inspiration from other things when all this is going on. Thank, thank you so much, sir. It's a, been a fascinating evening and especially a great stress buster. The people who have watched this one and a half hours spent with you, is, I'm going to do a lot of good. And uh, I also want to take this opportunity. Uh, we had a brief chat, uh, Mr. Krishnamurti, that you are wanting to help uh, members of MMA with a special offer. Please do send it to me. I will be happy to share with all the members who are watching this program, members of MMA. In case they need, they can use the facility which you have offered them uh, uh, as a special uh, to the members of MMA. Thankful. Thank you, Sheila, Dr. Dr. Sheila, for joining Thank us from Woody. Uh, yeah, I know Woody is a different. No, that's why I said uh, uh, the power cut is always be a problem there. <laughs> no, I think it's, everything went off well today because uh, <laughs> hill stations always have the issue. 
Thank you yeah. for joining. Your insight has uh, been a great uh, motivating factor for all our members. Uh, thank you, members who are joined in uh, such a big number. Uh, you are you are you are adrenaline which pumps us to do so many events for you day after day because you are not disappointed. You are joined a big number today. Hundred people logged in, and we have to close it uh, uh, for the people. But all the viewers watching this program live on YouTube, Facebook, uh, and also webinar. Thanks so much. Now I'll tell uh, our technical team to unmute. May I request all of you to join uh, as a token of our appreciation to the, both the speakers who shared their.